<clears throat> thank you, Ty, and thank you, Boisman's Institute, for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here, obviously, my homeland. Um, and I put three really big topics here, and I have lots of slides, so we will see how far we go. Everybody can hear me? Uh, good. Okay, so I'm going to start by defining what a governance problem is or the way I would like us to think about a governance problem, and that is for all institutions in the private sector and in government and elsewhere. So the governance question is who makes decisions on behalf of an institution, whatever institution it is, what do they know when they make this decision? What should they know and what should be their constraints when they make these decisions? And what are their motivations when they make these decisions? Why would they do certain things? And then here's the question for the rest of us. Is it going to work out for us? So that's the question, the way I want to frame it. And I'm going to ask it about different institutions, uh, specifically in the banking sector. I put socially efficient in quotation mark. It's a little bit of a thing to define, but uh, I'll point out to things that are inefficient for sure, and then uh, we can um, decide what we want. So start with banking. Bottom line, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on banking. I've given many talks that were entirely on banking. I can talk about it for hours. Kind of getting tired of it, and in fact, I want to draw broader conclusions from that and view the banking as an example of a broader problem, just an extreme example of a problem. So my bottom line on banking, it's an inefficient industry, it's a dangerous sector, it's privileged, uh, and it's poorly regulated. So basically, there is severe governance problem in banking, okay? Start with the financial crisis, and this was a... Um, the report prepared by a committee, and this is a majority report of a committee in the United States Commission, uh, in the Financial Crisis Inquiry Report, FCIC called. It came out in uh, January 2011. And I'm quoting from the executive summary of this report, which was thousands of pages and archives and everything. The crisis was avoidable. It included, it was a result of widespread failures of regulation, of breakdown in corporate governance, a lot of borrowing too much, lack of transparency, governments being ill-prepared and having inconsistent response, and widespread breaches in accountability at all levels. In other words, there was governance problems and nobody paid much of a price or enough. So, bottom line, financial crisis was a result of a major governance problem of the type that I said we should worry about in the private sector and in the government. Those who made decisions on behalf of these various institutions somehow together didn't work out for us. Right after the financial crisis, the senator said banks are still the most powerful lobby on Capitol Hill, and there's competition there. There's lots of lobbies. Uh, and they frankly own the place. This is after the financial crisis. They own the place. So just reflect on that, a senator describing it that way. So you begin to see the problem. In 2010, a few months before that commission report, President Obama, then President Obama, signed a massive law that was rushed through Congress because there was a big crisis and we had to do something about it. The public wanted action, so we signed the Dodd-Frank Act, named after two senators. No more bailouts, lots of speeches, big smiles, signing the Dodd-Frank Act. What did the lobbyists say about that? It's the halftime. There was massive lobbying during the period of the discussion of Dodd-Frank Act, but it was halftime, meaning now we're going to do this, and then we're going to do that, and then we're going to do this, and this, and this. It's never over, actually. It's not just halftime. It's not over until today. 
It's never over. You can change it. You can sue. Ignore the regulators. Go back to the Congress. It's never over. The lobbyist has work to do all the time. These were a little bit of my opinions. I'm not going to bore you with all the different op-eds and all the other things I wrote about this, but this was one from five years after the crisis in the New York Times. This was after Ben Bernanke had his book, The Courage to Act, and my claim was that there was a lack of some other courage, political courage to act, but he had the courage to save everything. That's true, sent the ambulances when it all imploded. And more recently, as I was concluding this battle, because probably until there is another financial crisis, it's only going to get weaker and weaker in terms of any resolve to do something about it, that we missed, at least on one regulation that I happen to know about, we missed an opportunity to actually fix it when it spectacularly failed uh, and was shown to be completely badly designed and a totally inadequate type of regulation. I explained that in a paper that I wrote very grudgingly to a British publication fuming all the way about all the stuff I was reading at the very time. In 2013, I uh, finished, uh, came out a book. Uh, it's actually mentioned here, A Banker's New Clothes. It, it does exist in Hebrew. Translator sits right there, my brother. Um, and this book is trying to clear some confusion and to explain that the reason this confusion or the many different kinds of confusions arise here uh, is a sort of mix of genuine confusion and the sort of willful confusion, which is sort of, you know, I don't understand something is because I don't want to understand it, okay? It works for me not to understand it, on which Upton Sinclair said, you can't ex teach a man something if his salary depends on not understanding it. So that kind of dynamic, okay? So we tried to remove, my co-author Martin Helwig and I, uh, some of this confusion, because maybe people really do not understand some of these issues. Let's try to clear the fog. In the politics, here is some of what goes on in the politics of banking, okay? Banks over the money is, said the robber when asked why he robbed the bank. It's kind of a lame joke, but it's very deep. It, if you're going to collude with an institution, might as well be the one where the money is. You just can tell it what to do with the money and make a deal of some sort. Okay? So banks over the money, the politicians always have preferences about what they do with the money. Okay? If you give a guarantee to the bank, maybe explicitly, maybe implicitly, that not to worry, your debt will be paid, promise to the creditors, whether they're depositors or other, that everything will be okay, then it seems to the politician free to do. It's not on a budget, for one thing. When it comes, that's later. We can hope it doesn't come to that. So guarantees are very tempting to a politician to give if instead they can get the bank to do something. Now banks also have the money and they are private corporations, usually, unless they're publicly owned. They can decide what to do with it. Who gets a loan? How big the loan? What terms of the loan? Etc. That's their business to do that. Okay. Now, when it comes to regulation, there's always this notion that you know we can't regulate because some other country is not regulating. We got a whole level playing field, you know, especially now in the global world. So we can't do it because the other person's not doing it. Creates a sort of race to the bottom in the regulation or we love our banks, our banks have to win against the other banks as if we're in the Olympics. So there are all these champions kind of narratives, you know. The policymakers start worrying about their banks instead of their people. And that becomes a little bit muddled in their own heads about uh, who it is they're actually for. So like they say, what's good for GM, good for America, etc. okay? Don't forget central banks. We're not going to go into that, but that's part of banking. Central banks are very unusual institutions. Okay? I'm not going to talk about governance of central banks. It's just too much for here. But they really are very, very special. They stand between the private sector and the governments, and they can help everybody because they're, they have the magic. They have the magic. I see one of them here. Uh, the issues then seem, even though they're not that complicated, seem confusing to the public. 
and everybody needs a bank. So at some point, if you're confused, you're not going to challenge, uh, you're not going to call it because maybe you're wrong, whatever. Plus, you're going to offend the banker, and everybody needs a banker. So bottom line is banks get away with being the way they are. When you look at it, it's like, how can it be? And guess what? Here it is. They can be reckless. They can do all kinds of things. And in the end, not that much bad happens. Paul Volcker was a very famous central banker in the US. Some of you may remember him. And this is something he said to a senator back in 2012, reported in a book written by a, somebody who was a staffer for Joe Biden and then worked with another Senator Kaufman who was there to replace Biden in the, in the Senate. And Senator um, Kaufman was very special because Senator Kaufman was only there for two years and he wasn't running for re-election. That was a big deal because then he didn't need money from anybody. So, uh, and in this discussion, Paul Volcker says, every time you're going to say something that you're going to do to the bank, they'll always say, oh, don't do that. Credit will suffer and growth will suffer. That is how a politician gets scared. And then he added, it's all bullshit. This was confirmed with him. He said BS, same thing, OK? So here we go. I am not, I have probably 20, 30 slides. I have a document, we have a document I wrote after the book called The Parade Continues. It's like the emperor keeps marching. 31 flawed claims debunked, and we could edit some more distinct claims that we can sort of explain what's wrong with them. But I'll give you just a few examples of what it is about bullshit. So first of all, credit. Oh, here's my uh, warm, warm up, OK? The CEO, uh, then CEO, I should say ex-CEO, Stumpf was the CEO of Wells Fargo Bank. Wells Fargo Bank, I'll mention later, OK? It's been in the news recently. It happens to be my bank. I came to California, <laughs> opened an account, Wells Fargo Bank closest bank. I still have my account in Wells Fargo Bank. Terrible bank, but my money is insured. I don't have eight accounts or 14. I like have a checking account, basically. Um, he said to a reporter, this is after my book was published. It's not in the book, but it is in this Parade Continues document. We in Wells Fargo Bank have a lot of retail deposits. That's my money. And therefore, we don't have a lot of debt, he says. I could not make this up that a bank CEO would forget that he owes me the money. But you see, if you get into his head, what's going on is he doesn't feel like it's debt. Because I'm such a nice creditor, I leave him alone. Usually creditors kind of have you know, conditions. They kind of breathe down your neck, all of that. But not depositors. They're so nice. Walk in, give the money, no contract, no covenants, no conditions, what you do with it, who you, we can pay dividends, anything. Take it. So it feels like play money to the banker. So most companies that need to raise money actually need to have a business model, got to go pitch it, all of that. In bank, is just money comes. So it becomes, you get used to stuff like that. You know? So from his perspective, you know, Got deposits, why is, are the regulators asking him to go raise money from some creditors who are going to be really junior, might lose? You know, they call them Cocos, Tilax, whatever. No, he doesn't like that. They might ask a question, and they off, off chance they actually lose. He likes depositors, like me. OK. What did he just say? <clears throat> Front page of the Financial Times. This is more recent, so I have like 20 in between them. This is some of Trump's staffer. Came from Goldman Sachs, okay? Banks are forced to hoard money. They're forced to hoard capital, English not mine, and they cannot take any risk. Dodd-Frank prohibits them from lending. He said that. This is simply false. You have to just remember these banks just paid dividends. There was Plenty of money to lend. If they didn't lend, they didn't want to lend. They prefer to do something else. Take the money out, invest in derivatives, whatever. No law prevents them from having taken the money they had just paid out and uh, make a loan with it. So this is just false. There's no law that prevents banks from lending. 
Now we get to this question of credit. So now again, you get into this narrative. Credit is such a positive word in the English language. It really is, you know, you got credit out of a movie, you know. You got credit, it's good. So you use that word. Credit will suffer a terrible, terrible thing. Debt, not such a good word. Two sides of the same coin. But I always say credit will suffer. I mean, give you credit. Meaning you'll owe me, okay? Good or bad? Well, that is bad, credit is good, same thing, okay? You can't say what it is. The right question are, are we making the right investments? Things that should be funded, are they funded? And then, is the funding mix debt, equity, convertible, something else? Is that the way, best way to fund it, okay? Then, obviously, related. Who is it that gets the loan? Is it the right loan to make? Was it a good decision to make? Why are we subsidizing debt as a form of funding? Do we have to, for example, for corporations? Do we have to give debt an advantage over equity? We don't have to, but we do. Why? Stupid policy. Stupid policy. We subsidize housing, but not by subsidizing housing directly, if we want to encourage home ownership, but by subsidizing borrowing to buy house. In the US, they subsidize education through loans to students, not directly. Uh, so, bottom line on banking. It takes a village to make it so bad. Lots of enablers, okay? So when you look at, the sentence comes from a movie about sexual harassment in the spotlight, in the Catholic Church, if it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a village to abuse a child, it takes a village to maintain the system. Who are all the enablers? Everybody in the private sector is fine. They do what they'll do, which we'll talk about in a second. And then you've got all the watchdogs in the private sector, credit rating agencies, auditors. Then you've got the supervisors and regulators. They do what they do, but you know, as a system as a whole, they're part of that system, okay? Central bankers, politicians, the media, and academics. I can talk to all of those things in detail, okay? Exactly what each one of them do. I have a paper called It Takes a Village to Maintain Dangerous Financial System. It's an essay on ethics, okay? So in this whole story between the politics, the nonsense, the confusion, and all the incentives of everybody around to stand by or to let it be as it is or do whatever you do because of your own incentives, the nonsense can win a debate. So you can have bad policies for the wrong reasons. Spin, the way you present it, provides justification, so uh, some of these claims that people make, and people get confused. You actually confuse them, they need a loan, you threaten them, something you know terrible will happen, growth will suffer, all of that. So that's what happens. So here's one narrative. There's a narrative that the crisis was like a natural disaster, a 100-year flood, an earthquake. Obviously, when a natural disaster happens, we want all the help. So, but you saw the Financial Crisis Inquiry Committee, not a natural disaster. People made disaster. Men made, mostly men probably, but anyway, people. Preventable, right? Now we get to conduct. Okay, this is not about risk and who bears it as much as the fact that banks keep being caught at all kinds of conduct, like fraud, opening extra accounts, LIBOR, money laundering, tax evasion, all kinds of things like that. 320, well, this, it's gone up since then because at least there was one more billion for the, for, for the uh, Wells Fargo recently. So by this count, $321 billion in fines, okay? Some shareholders' money was, there were written checks, okay? $321 billion, but no worry, they made a trillion, okay? So over this period of time. So somehow, you know, it's like a toll booth. You pay the fine, you keep going. Make enough money to pay the fines and pay the salaries, everything else. So what about that? What kind of corporation? A set of corporations, sector, pays so much in fines. Why? Are the fines too much? Government just extorting them for all this money or 
settlement for something they did wrong, breaking the law, but they don't admit it, on and on, settlements, okay? Narrative, a few bad apples, okay? Every time it's like, oh, not a big problem, but just oh, a few priests, a few traders in Liber were very disappointed these people broke the law. It's not a systemic problem, it's just we'll pay a fine. So I came across this a while ago, and I later found out that maybe it wasn't uh, by the Rothschild. It's not clear. There's some controversy about this quote. Uh, the thing at the end, at the bottom says, trust me, and then behind it says, I'm lying. Okay, so anyway, uh, <laughs> so this supposedly came from a letter that the Rothschild brothers sent uh, in 1863. The few who understand the system, the financial system, will either be so interested in its profits or so dependent upon its favors, spelled in uh, bridge, uh, that there would be no opposition to whatever it is that was being discussed in the letter from that class, while the great body of people mentally incapable of comprehending the tremendous advantage that capital derives from the system will bear its burdens without complaining and perhaps without suspecting that the system is inimical to their interests. So you kind of have the public not fully quite understanding what just happened and the people in the system being just okay, doing okay. I've t tried this line on many people in the current financial system and when I presented with this line, they said, oh, that sounds right for today. So I'm moving on to the second subject of my talk. Okay, so this was a little bit about banking and it sort of asked the question, what's wrong with banking a little bit uh, and basically, I didn't give you all the details, but I gave you the bottom line of that. And it's a few examples. So corporate governance and policy failures is sort of what we saw. Somehow the combination of all the decisions by all the people involved doesn't work out. Does this happen beyond banking? Well, it does. And here in the last year and a half uh, or two, I've gone back to the corporate form and to things I thought about more than a decade ago as a finance professor interested in corporate governance and what economists usually think of as a corporate governance problem. I'm quoting Yuval Harari here first. The corporation is the, something we created in our heads, okay? It's an abstract thing, figment of our imagine, collective imagination, an ingenious invention, okay? What is a corporation? Well. It's not an asset, it's a legal thing, okay? So it's a legal, you can call it person, okay? It's an a thing you go and create in the law, okay? It's separate from all individuals. It exists separate from all human beings. It gives it a certain longevity beyond all people. It's not like a partnership that you can, anybody can dissolve. It's very strong in that way, in its existence, okay? Now, the Existence of this person and the rights of this person are all in the law, okay? So each law would give them right. The usual rights would be property rights. Locked in capital was a big invention. This, I want to go to the history in a second. Uh, that was the thing. What does it mean locked in? It means the following. The shareholders, the providers of the main long life capital for this, are separating with their money, and it's gone. Now, you know, there are forces that would make the corporation pay them dividends or whatever, but they cannot walk into the corporation and say, oops, give me my money back. They can go through the governance process or whatever, but legally, it's not theirs anymore. It belongs to the corporation, okay? Then, of course, they get limited liability, meaning that if they take a debt and they can't pay it, or they have a fine or whatever it is, the salary, they can't pay whatever they promised, then they could just say, oops, take the assets, I'm out of here. So the people involved, their own assets are protected from the corporation's liabilities of any sort, be it any fines or, or accidents or debts or whatever, okay? It also means that you can trade the shares in markets, all of that. In the US, 
corporations get political, political speech right. They're not voters, but we gave them the right to speak. Not just in advertisement or something, to speak, make a donation. We even gave them a little religious rights. If they say, oh, my religion prevents me from you know, giving contraceptives, Supreme Court allowed that. So they go, they don't, you know, to get rights, they don't march on Washington, they go to the courts. Because their rights are in the courts. History is that it started in the 17th century in its current form. So the first ones were like East Dutch, East India, British, uh, English, East India. They went off to sea. They were like governments. They had armies. They went on bringing spices and all that. That's before governments were doing these kinds of things, what the Spanish government was doing. The same thing, but not in private corporations. In the US, in the end of the 19th century, they were building infrastructure. Government wasn't taxes, taxing as much. You needed to build a bridge or a tunnel. You collected money, and you created a corporation. You asked for a special permit to do that. You needed a special charter from the government. You needed to vote on it. And then you became a thing, a corporation, and oftentimes owned by the people who consumed what the corporation was was producing or what it was doing. In the process of getting limited liability rights and tradability of assets sometimes and all of that, banks were special in that they had printed a lot of IOUs, not necessarily with central banks, private money, and the depositors needed to trust them, so they often had like extra liability for their shareholders. Double, triple, unlimited liability, so they were some of the last institutions to be allowed to walk away from their debts. So if they, if they before deposit insurance, if they, could, if they didn't, couldn't pay the deposits, the shareholders had to shell out money from their own thing. Nowadays, incorporation is super easy. Not only do you not need a vote of Congress to become a corporation, you go to Delaware, pay a little money, money, you don't even need an ID. In Delaware, you can take a lawyer, they'll make you a corporation, you don't have to have any activity there, you could form this corporation literally just to hide behind an entity, buy property. You could be, for all we know, uh, a dictator from Africa with, uh, with some ill-gotten funds. But in the US, you can launder that money in the United States of America. Delaware has hundreds of thousands, if not more, corporations. Many of them have no business in Delaware at all, except they fill the coffers of the state of Delaware. The state of Delaware loves it. It's the capital of incorporation. And um, when the U.S. Uh, was challenged to uh, keep track of beneficial owners of corporation, it's been dragging its feet. So despite G20 decision that we had to have less opacity of corporations, the U.S. is probably in some parts of Canada some of the biggest money laundering havens around. So let's go to corporate governance. The mantra in corporate governance is what Milton Friedman said. It still guides what we teach in business schools. Corporations should make as much money as possible while adhering to the laws of society, in the, but the rules of society in the law and in the ethics, said Milton Friedman, okay? Famous article, and that is basically, don't talk to me about purposes, corporate social responsibility, all these things, just make money, shareholders will decide what to do with it, that's what corporations should do make as much money as possible. What does that actually mean? The way we teach it in corporate finance, every corporate finance textbook, treats the shareholders as if they are owners. Remember, they are not owners. They just happen to have the shares that are pieces of paper that entitle them to, I don't know, vote for directors or a few other things, and sit and wait for dividends to arrive or the stock price to go up, okay? But we teach that corporations should maximize the stock price. That that is the measure of what the purpose of the whole thing is about. And the way we operationalize it, it is that in the standard view of it, the corporation exists for the shareholders. And the way to make a corporation uh, do the right thing for the shareholders is to give incentives in these days financialized form based on accounting profit, accounting profit stocks, or return on equity, some other financial measures. That is how managers are compensated, supposedly to align them with the shareholders so that shareholders will be happy. That is the theory and that's what we teach. So this approach 
makes sense. However, it assumes a lot of things. What does it assume? It assumes the markets are competitive. So in Milton Friedman's thing, you know, free competitive markets without deception and fraud, assumes. And why is it OK to worry only about the shareholders? Because everybody else has contracts, markets, laws. So not to worry about employees, customers, citizens. The laws will take care of them if the corporation pollutes or kills or does anything. Uh, and the law will take care of it. The contract will take care of it for the employees, for the customers. The contract, they can sue in courts, whatever. And competitive markets, you know, you'll have to pay fair salaries because uh, otherwise then people would leave or you have to give the right, you know, product at the right price, otherwise markets, et cetera. No worry about customers or uh, employees or anybody else because everybody else is protected by some contract or other or laws. What's being ignored is that somehow these laws are taken as if they just land on us. But that's not the way it works. Laws are people made. It's a big process to write them. Not that, that simple. And corporations get involved. Remember, they have political speech rights in the US. They get involved. They got people in them. They have certain incentives, uh, certain desires, opinions, information. They want to be part of it. So they get involved. OK, we want everybody to be involved. The question is, does it produce a good outcome? Corporation is very opaque. So when it starts being about the contracts and the laws, do you even know if the law was, break, but was broken? How do you, what do you do if it is broken? The fines, remember? OK. Who is responsible when they break the law? What do you do? You can't put the corporation in jail. Can you put anybody in jail? And then, of course, you got the Police people, the people who write the laws, the people who enforce the laws, the regulators, all of that. What about them? Are they always making the right decision? They're full of people. What about that governance problem? Okay. So as a society, they always talk about regulations are terrible. You know, laws are good. There's all this confusion. Okay, traffic laws regulate traffic. Okay, we agree as a society, there's a certain speed you shouldn't pass. In this road, in that road, police, you know, and, and, and the law might be vague. It might say, in the California, the law says, you know, if the speed limit is 55, that's the maximum speed, but you have to drive at a safe speed. So the policeman can stop you and say, well, you know, it was 55, but today's foggy, you drove too fast, even at 50. So it's a safe speed. Got to be a safe speed, okay? And we accept that the policeman uh, might stop us. We don't go lobbying, arguing, usually hopeless. Okay, so there's enforcement of those. Here's enforcement, okay? So the referee in a soccer game needs to be fair, okay? Here is the player lobbying about the red card. Here are the lobbies. They are often on K Street in the US, okay? They populate explicit lobbying. They are there to represent certain interests. Now, that's kind of overground. Underground is a whole other world of lobbying. Consultants and PRs and lawyers and my friends somewhere are going to write an op-ed or talk to somebody. The whole system of people who are not defined as lobbying, but they get involved. Okay? So what can happen? You can have fraud. And here are a few examples. I'll show you images in a second. You can have deception. This is sort of not quite illegal, but you know, marketing. I got you to buy something, confuse you about the you know, health benefits or harms of a product, et cetera, et cetera. I can endanger you. Okay, so that's sort of like what the banks do. You know, I'll produce a product. You know, there's a lot of endangers out there. So, I, you know, a car has a danger of imploding, but maybe my car is, you know, less safe than I claim it is. Um, on and on, I'll show you some examples. Or maybe I didn't protect your data. Uh, Carefully enough, these days it's very common. Uh, or, you know, I produce something unsafe and then later it's like, oops, you know, sorry, I, I, I recalled the product, but I didn't let you know. Uh, if it's a car, I do let you know. All kinds of law evasions that happen. 
And they matter, they add up. So it's not like, oh, a little bit happened here and there. This is a pervasive. And I'm going to flash a number of images to kind of shock you, OK? Oh, this is my cartoon, first of all. Yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment of time, we created a lot of value for our shareholders. So this is kind of the, the essence of, 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 of the problem, OK? So here's what can happen. In London, there was a fire. If you read about that fire, it was well known. I'm talking about preventable things. I mean, I know that there aren't preventable things. But the fire was in a high-rise building built with materials that are known to be extremely dangerous in a high-rise. You cannot really control those flames. In fact, they make the building really, really dangerous for people inside it. Okay, So that was that fire. There were many, many warnings about this problem. UK allowed it, but other countries did not. The marketing materials of the companies were special to the UK, where they could sell this stuff. Okay. Japan. This was a preventable nuclear disaster. Okay, Not the tsunami was not preventable, but the nuclear disaster was highly preventable. And it wasn't much of, a, of an investment to have prevented it. It just was. Uh, unlikely event, and they cut the corners continuously because it was a what's called the nuclear village was Takada and the regulators, revolving doors and all of that. So it was a clear cut regulatory capture case on something very important. Ah, was Volkswagen. Volkswagen, for some years, has been lying about um, and producing specific ways to defraud regulators on emission standards. They have confused everybody about diesel and polluted the air in Europe and in the US until the US regulators uh, got um, a hold of this problem. Massive. So there's a book about this, Faster, Higher, Farther, how one of the world's largest automakers committed a massive and stunning fraud. And it's still going on. This is just recently. OK, this still goes on. So all these news, you know, you kind of get numb to them after a while. But if you pay attention. You know, GM. GM produced cars that had a part that was defective, was causing the, the ignition to stop suddenly. Again, went on for a while. The knowledge about this was inside the company, but somehow it didn't come to the surface. And they continued to produce the same type of part with the same number, didn't even change it when eventually the engineer did know that it was causing the problems, but the information was never came in. Discover, got discovered from the outside the corporation, not from inside the corporation. And then it became a big scandal. Because it turned out, people died, and people were put almost in trial for killing other people for something that GM, as a company, did. So here is the guy saying, GM killed our daughter. GM, the corporation. Equifax. Oops lost the data of, what, 140 million people subjected, all of us that had data with them, to identity theft. We all had to rush and buy all kinds of protection, some of it from Equifax, so they use it for marketing too. And, and it was like, oops, who's responsible for that? Well, you know, when you give them personal data, social security numbers, all kinds of things that you can go get loans with, People had to freeze their credits. I had to freeze my credit. I was afraid somebody would borrow in my name. Facebook. This is an old title. It's been going on for a while, OK? What happened with the data? What's about the business model? What about addiction? On and on. And I'm not mentioning cigarettes here or other things. Here is the CEO of HSBC after some tax scandal. He said, oh, I can't keep track of so many people, 257,000 people. I don't know what they're all doing. So he's basically saying, I can't govern its corporations. It's too big, OK? Too complicated. I mean, that's what he's saying. It got too big for me. I don't know what they're doing. I don't have a way to create mechanisms to prevent them from breaking the law. I can't do compliance. Wells Fargo, the classic. I spend a lot of time thinking nowadays about what anybody could do about this. The corporation had a culture of opening a lot of accounts. Somebody asked me how many accounts I have. Eight is great, they used to say. That was kind of the mantra. The more, the better. Consumer, the bank has lots and lots of divisions. The consumer finance was defined as a sales corporation, like a supermarket. You want to sell, 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 more accounts. 
So you convince people, young people, old people who don't know that they need another account and another account and another account. If they don't agree, you open an account for them anyway. And this went on for years. 2013, they already got hit by a US, by a California attorney with a fine, and it was in the newspaper, so there's no, I didn't know about it for the board or any of that. And it went on and on until at a moment of time in fall 2016, before the election last year, they got a bigger fine. And all of a sudden, in the middle of this election campaign, it was a big, big news. Ah, wonderful time for the Senate and Congress to bring in that same stump who said he doesn't remember he owes me the money, and uh, beat up on him. Beat up on him, eventually the board lets him go. Not because the board woke up in the morning and decided to fire Stump, but because politically became a problem and bottom line became a problem because everybody was angry with Wells Fargo. And what was special about this is that Wells Fargo's fraud was so simple that every person could understand. Open an account for you, okay? There's a lot of fraud that is much more complicated than that. Some accounting on derivatives or something like that. Nobody in the street is going to understand the issue at all. So if you tell them it happened or not happened, they'll have to an expert would have to explain it. Wells Fargo had fraud and deception in many practices. They attached insurance to car loans that people didn't need. They changed the terms of mortgages. They overcharged in the foreign exchange transaction, on and on and on and on, okay? Huge rap sheet, and they're not the only ones. There's city, there's all. What's the punishment? Oh, here's the writing. I will not say, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so, what happens then is about the challenge of enforcement at all, as I said. How do you know that the law was broken? Eventually it was Fargo. There was enough of this that eventually came to light. You do it a little bit, nobody knows that you did that. A lot of other fraud is invisible. It's not the kind of harm where you see somebody dead in the street. It's very abstract. It's just lying, basically, or it could be some other thing that's by the rules, maybe, but it still creates you know, confusion for investors or for regulators or something like that. Sometimes in the agreement when you agree to service, you sign away your legal rights to sue. So nowadays they'll say in the small print, you have to go to arbitration. Arbitration is usually stacked up against small individuals versus the repeated customers of the corporate. It's a private legal system, basically. And then, of course, I didn't know it wasn't me, somebody else. They didn't do what I told them. Or, you know, it's a lower level person. You don't want to go after them, et cetera. So nobody's responsible. Nobody's responsible. And then they start settling. So if you get into this thing, it's all about how the Department of Justice doesn't want to spend a lot of time, money. So they tell the corporation, OK, you investigate. You bring me uh, your investigation. You pay the lawyers. There's a whole industry about this, about $3 billion of industry kind of doing internal investigations for corporations. And they come to the Department of Justice and say, OK, here's what we found. And now let's settle on a number. And they settle on a number. And they pay with shareholders' money. And that's the end of that. Next time, they go back, OK? The leaders usually very, worse that happens to them is what happened to Stump, OK? Loses his job. They even took a little bit of money back. He's OK. Uh, last I know, he's not on the street, OK? Uh, recidivism is rampant, meaning repeat offenders, OK? It is not the same people. Again, the corporation repeats, does something else. In fact, there was a case uh, with, a, I think, Pfizer or some um, drug manufacturer, and they kept breaking certain laws. The judge, when he spoke to my class, was saying, well, I mean, they kept breaking and they kept saying, you know, it's a deferred prosecution, deferred prosecution, you keep deferring the prosecution, they're paying the fine, but they keep doing it. So why, why are we deferring? Why are we settling? Well, you know, they're producing drugs that we consume, pharmaceuticals. You can't kill the company. So they created another subsidiary. A subsidiary was committed, admitted to a crime, so that subsidiary couldn't do anything, but the corporation persisted. So you can't kill a corporation if they produce something we like. So we got a problem there. Justice system is not working. OK, it's very hard to enforce laws on institutions. OK, so the last part of my talk is inequality. I'm going to go fast here. Uh, well, how, what does it have to do with inequality? Well, here you see the 1% 
uh, started right after the crisis. This Occupy Wall Street, okay, was not necessarily about banks. They called themselves the 1%, 99%, so it was about inequality. But here's the, here's the thing, billions for bombs and banks. Why are they spending all this money on, on the banks, okay? Now, what form does it take? In this country, uh, governments always sort of give a lot of tax breaks to corporations. So in the U.S., it was a whole spectacle about cities competing uh, for the affection of Amazon to open their second headquarters. Maryland gave it, like, unbelievable tax breaks. They were returning back personal taxes of the, uh, the meanwhile, of course, the municipality has to build schools and has to do all these things. It doesn't get any tax from the corporation. In the pharmacy, it would create jobs, and somehow it would all work out. You know, you have big incentives for Intel right now in Kiryat Gat, my hometown. And anyway, what ends up happening is that uh, the, peop the cities with highest inequalities often are giving the most tax breaks to corporations. So it's not clear this is really working out. The other thing is, you look at now at the way, uh, there's an exhi exhibit I just went to about evicted, about evictions from rental properties and payday lending. A lot of deceptive practices, mostly by corporations. So a lot of homeowner, uh, home ownership is by corporations renting with all kinds of practices. And they are mostly corporations. Couple of final slides. So in, in salaries, uh, usually the top levels get paid more, shared of the increasing profits of corporations. Their wages are low. And uh, if you go to trade agreements, there is this very strange things about the ability of corporations to sue governments. So one classic example was Philip Morris suing the uh, government of Australia for effective cigarette advertise, uh, effective cigarettes against cigarette smoking. So Philip Morris is saying, not only can you not expropriate my building, but I'm entitled to profit. If you tell your people not to smoke cigarettes, my profits are harmed. Stop doing that. It is pathetic, <laughs> perverse, that governments can no longer pre pre prevent their, their citizens from, protect their citizens from harm because of corporate sort of birthright to profit. And this happens when corporations sue governments. It's a really strange process that was created when the trade agreement started way back for wanting foreign investment. And it was mostly corporations in rich countries suing weak governments. They don't have enough money to even protect themselves in these processes. So that's another form of kind of injustice that happens in the world. Okay, so I'm gonna finish by the following. Nobody in the street is gonna know about accounting standards, but you gotta start there, okay? So I am a finance professor, but I say jo half jokingly only that the biggest fields in the business school are marketing, that's all about the smoke and mirrors, and accounting. Okay, because accounting is the underbelly of all capitalism. Accounting, sometimes you have private companies, they don't have any disclosures, but this is a book called Political Standards, Corporate Interest, Ideology, and Leadership in the Shaping of Accounting Rules for the Market Economy. So this is about the politics of setting accounting rules. And I can speak to that, but let me just say, the governance challenge is, I'm just back from DC, in which for the very first time, and really it's not a word we use in business schools very much, the word corruption, okay? So, what is corruption? The abuse of power for private gains. That's a general definition of corruption, okay? It takes many forms. So we think of corruption bribes, okay? Bags of money. But in developed countries, a lot of corruption is just controlling the rules, okay? So excessive, narrow interest on writing and enforcing of rules more generally. And that is a corruptive thing. Why does it happen? People with better information and more controls are taking advantage of people with less information and less control. And the author of this book called it Thin Political Markets. You'd think, okay, in a political process, all opinions will come, we'll kind of cancel each other out, we'll get the right outcome. Well, not so, not so easy because the dispersed uninformed public is not organized to actually have a voice, doesn't even know what it should be like, and that gives space to organized uh, power voices, okay? And the experts are conflicted. So, Louis Brandeis said, famous uh, thought leader in, uh, in the Supreme Court justice, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Bring the fact, and that would be uh, uh, the disclosures will 
not so fast, because it's not even enough. First of all, how do you shine the light? And secondly, how do people use that information? So you can, in the US right now, you can give me all information about campaign donations, and it doesn't help a thing, OK? Because it's slow legal, so it's fine. So that's it. I'm going to end here and just leave you where challenges having to do with governance. We want to have good rules in developed countries and in developing countries. The, the, the challenges are not only in developing countries, but we have anger for the public that is taken advantage of by demagogues, including in the United States right now and elsewhere. That's very worrying for democracy, for capitalism, for everything. So I'm concerned. Thank you. Sorry, I'd be happy to talk to people here, but. Oh. Okay, if, you, if people are willing to stay, I'm happy to answer. We will take three or four questions from the crowd, please. They want to go home, have a drink. <laughs> Shell shock, yes. Let me just ask a question. So, what's the general outline of the correct So my solution away from the book was, you know, we say unless the public understands more, you can't have political accountability. So I teach now a course at Stanford called Finance and Society in which I want to create savvier consumers of the financial system and better educated citizens. I only do 150 undergrads a year, uh, but they don't learn it in high school. So how would they know what's, what they're being told and all the stuff they read in the paper when it's wrong? So educated citizens, that's why you know, in the description of this talk, it said the importance of having more educated citizenry. Otherwise, democracy is not going to work. Otherwise, you just have to hope that your dictator is benevolent. That's right. So we have waited. Yeah. So, yeah. So Larry Lessig, uh, the law academic, wrote the, the uh, Lost Republic, I think, is the book, and he was basically saying, you know, the the very few get to decide who's on the ballot in the U.S. So what kind of a democracy is it? Yes, it's one one person, one vote. But who gets to put the people on the ballot? Who gets to even run? Well, you need a lot of money to run in the U.S. So that's the campaign finance system that we have. And so democracy depends on all these details of, uh, of campaign financing and all of that. That's right. Yeah. So in, in the US, money is voice. Yes. Yeah, so you mentioned about democracy because I come from China. So I'm curious if there's any study about you know, one party kind of finance regulation versus democracy in the US and the Asian So it is very interesting that you know, democracy and good rules, are it's not the same thing. Okay, so you can have, you can be lucky and have some good rules or you can have dictators that actually, you know, do okay, uh, might or might not be corrupt, uh, and democracies that are corrupt uh, or that don't work that well. So it's kind of more nuanced than, than that. We tend to think liberal democracies will win, end of history, uh, Fukuyama said, you know, that's it, done. And he lives to having to regret the statement that it's the end of history uh, for modern. Talk about the next financial crisis that is looming. Can you uh, maybe sketch a few uh, scenarios for uh, what could bring the economy down? My first fear is, uh, is hacking cybersecurity. You know, I wake up in the morning and the computers were hacked. I mean, they already sold, you know, stole money from the New York Fed. I don't know that we know everything that happens because they want trust in the system. So, but you know, are this? Uh, we all depend on computers nowadays, and data is on the computer. What if there's a huge hack? So that could be a way to start. Uh, otherwise, you just have the kind of the usual suspect that might start it. People who are looking at this are saying that it, it looks not that different from 2006, 
right now, so you got to repeat. I don't know if right now, so my, you know, you're kind of driving fast. You hope for the best around the next curve. System is fragile, so it could be any number of things that would that would start it. You know, what's really where is the, the, the risks building up? And and because of the global economy, there's a lot more kind of contagion, so crisis become more global more easily, whereas in the past they may have been more contained. Yes, maybe last one. My, look, uh, you know, when we teach economics, we start with, you know, perfect markets. We start with, you know, the results of uh, general equilibrium where everything is perfect. You know, you could have a lawmaker in the U.S. saying, I took Econ 1 and I learned to be a Republican and a Libertarian and government should get out because they taught me in Econ 1 that markets work great. Now, Ken Arrow, who just died last year, was the greatest economist, his actual thesis was a different result. And his result on public choice was actually an impossibility result. You cannot aggregate easily people's preferences except through a dictator uh, and get a social welfare function. So if we started teaching economics from that result, we would be nowhere. We wouldn't know where to begin to create a system. So you know, the question is then, uh, how do we create a sort of a, not first best, but second, third, fifth best, given the constraints that we have on, on processing of information, expertise, other things. I do think there's better, but you know, there, we, you'd come down to a bunch of su policy suggestions that would help, you know, that would you know, create a better, you know, Singapore has better paid people in the public sector, and they, you know, so they revolve less, and they're more proud of their work, and they might, be, might have more, more integrity or something like that when they create rules. Uh, you know, you need whistleblower protection laws, you need uh, uh, all kinds of, you know, other things to improve the quality of, uh, of making, making and enforcing rules. You know, you need budgets for white collar crime, maybe. They reduced those budgets after 9-11, well, went to terrorism, so now we don't do it anymore. So white collar criminals learned that. Thank you, Anat. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. Good night. Thanks. Thank you.